Okay. All right, we're about ready to get started. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pam Wright, the Chief Innovation Officer at the National Archives. And I want to start by thanking the National Archives Assembly Outreach Committee. Lopez right there. Thank you very much for co-sponsoring and helping us to get the word out about today's event. The Office of Innovation is so pleased to host John Voss as our speaker this morning. Uh, John is the first speaker in what we hope to establish as a series of speakers who can provide NARA with fresh views, new ideas about what we're doing now and what we can think about doing in the future. John has innovated, innovated solutions and community new management on big picture problems for 15 years, which means you must have started at age 10 or so. In the mid-90s, his early work on social responsibility led him to develop new business practices for musical festivals and rock stars through his work with the Tibetan Freedom Concerts, artists like the Beastie Boys, David Crosby, and Wycliffe Jean. A decade later, he helped religious communities and other institutions develop and implement technology infrastructure and strategies that fit with their beliefs, culture, and daily practice. He served as the IT director for the San Francisco Zen Center before running his own IT consulting firm for seven years. Today, John is the History Pin Strategic Partnerships Director at We Are What We Do, a global not-for-profit behavior change agency. John is helping to build an open ecosystem of historical data across libraries, archives, <coughs> and museums worldwide through his work with History Pin and as one of the organizers of the International Linked Open Data in Libraries, Archives, and Museums Summit. John was the keynote speaker at uh, SAA's annual conference last summer in, in uh, San Diego, and his presentation really brought down the house. Um, I talked with David about it afterwards, and uh, David Ferriero, who uh, really wanted to bring him in, and uh, is sorry he can't be here today. Um, but we're really glad to have you, John, and uh, welcome you to the National Archives. All right. Thank you. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I have to say, uh, after yesterday and the inauguration, I'm feeling particularly patriotic and uh, hope that I can be of some small service to my country. I know you all probably take it for granted that you work for the federal government. Uh, but for me, coming from San Francisco and kind of being amongst enthusiasts and history geeks, uh, this is a really big deal for me and, and for many people like me who, who do this almost as a hobby and have been able to make a, a career out of it. Let me, my dear wife, wishing me luck. I love that. <laughs> Um, it's, it's, so, it's, so it's great to be here. And, and I think that when we look at all the different issues that came up yesterday, the kind of the dreams of the next four years, or even further than that, um, history maybe comes up low on the list of all the different issues. Uh, but I, I really feel like, um, particularly given the chance to give history a local and a personal feel, that we do have the opportunity to use it as a connector and as a bridge that uh, can, can can bridge divides, ultimately, between what we're, what we're dealing with in the country and um, kind of find what we have in common before we look at what we have apart. So that's, uh, I want to kind of couch this presentation in that and know that you all have a critical role to play and, and I'm excited to just to be here with you for the day and, and to explore that. Um, so for my part, I'm going to tell just a little bit of a story here of, of how I got involved. Let me make sure this thing is still on so I can walk around. There we go. Um, about in 2009, I started just uh, sort of a passion project that was called Look Back Maps then. And it was really about trying to take historical photos and put it on a map for my own neighborhood. And I realized that this was something a lot of people were trying to do. It seemed like a pretty easy thing to do for me at the time. You know, just take photos, put it on a map, see what your neighborhood looked like. And so I started reaching out to archives and libraries and saying, hey, what do you think? Let's do this together. And, and at first, I was a little bit panicky. You know, and I talked to uh, my friend Lori Lindbergh, who's a uh, uh, San Jose State University, an archivist there, and, and uh, you know, she said, John, just calm down. Look, we do this so that we can, people can access it. John, we archive things so people can, can
can use them and find them. And that was a real eye-opener for me. And it, and it opened the door for this idea of really creating an environment of historical data and how people can use it. And so we started to talk about this idea of linked open <coughs> data. Remember when libraries, archives, and museums captured imaginations by connecting information and led the internet revolution? So this was a, a teaser that we did for um, the Ignite Talks at the Smithsonian uh, at some point in 2011, I think. And the hope here was that we could start to look at this idea of, of going from a web of documents to a web of data, and how particularly libraries, archives, and museums play a crucial role in this. Now, you know, back when the web started, for me, it was in libraries. I mean, I, I was in university in 1991, even though Pam thinks that I'm only 20, I'm turning 40 <laughs> this year, you know? So when I was in university in, in, in 1991, this was kind of the revolutionary aspect of the library. We were moving from the card catalogs to the computer terminals, being able to find books in different locations. You know, that's how it started. And this idea of connecting books to ultimately connecting to people. This was really where the web came about. And this was a revolutionary space for me, where it would take you know, this time where you started spending a lot of time in the library, because not only were you finding the resources that you needed for your paper, but you were finding people at other campuses. You were finding people at other things in common with you. You were talking to girls on other campuses, spending <laughs> limitless hours in the library, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but didn't help my grades any. Um, and that was the beginning of the World Wide Web in libraries. Now, if we look at this in context, this is a great site called evolutionoftheweb.com. And really what it does is it maps, these photos are things that I've added on the side, but what it does is map the evolutions of the technologies of the web, um, starting with that HTTP protocol, you know, back in 1991. And what I found interesting is to start putting this in some social context of what was happening in the world at that time. You know, you look at uh, Tiananmen Square, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of apartheid, you know, all these things were happening. The world was coming together in a way that kind of created this environment for me culturally as well as technologically that we could reach out and, and play a bigger role in each other's lives. And then you see as that web evolved very quickly um, to where we get to, used to it now where you see Safari, Firefox come in, <coughs> and all these different technologies. And it goes on, I can't even fit it all on this screen obviously of all the different technologies that we're faced with now. But back in the day, it was very simple. You know, it wasn't a lot of graphical interfaces and whatnot. It was just this idea of connecting and finding information. So what I want to talk about a bit is uh, the culture, the technology, and the law that makes this environment possible and gives us a really unique opportunity right now to engage with this idea of radically open cultural heritage data on the web. So starting with culture, um, there's really a new paradigm, and I like to talk about the mashup culture. Uh, that people today are used to getting all kinds of information and putting it together in different ways. It would be at music, movies, uh, information, emails, however we do it. And I like to use this analogy here. Um, it's a DJ called Girl Talk. And you can see that they mix up, that Girl Talk mashes up different songs from different generations. So you've got Simon and Garfunkel, you've got Lil Jon, you've got Kid and Play, different generations making one exciting experience. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do with cultural heritage, potentially. You gotta let the Grateful Dead in there. NXS, you know, ma making this one experience. So is the DJ in the archives? That's really the question for me, you know? This is either a dream come true or, or a nightmare, perhaps, you know, I don't know. For me, it's, it's definitely a dream, you know? And I have to say, I don't think we're that far away from this. 
Uh, you know, this, I don't know if that's what your office looks like when you're finding new things, you know, but <laughs> that's what it feels like for me, you know, I have to say. It's that kind of a feel. It doesn't quite look like that, but, you know, but, but we're not that far. I mean, we're seeing mashups all the time with open cultural heritage. Here's an example from yesterday. This was released in 2005. Somebody tweeted out yesterday, I picked it up. This is the idea of a mashup culture, where we're reinterpreting the information of the past to reflect our experience today. This is another example. In 2010, the national, this is you know, a talk that I give around the world, and I've, I love touting this, this uh, postcard contest that you guys did in, in 2010. And so at the time, I was using look back maps. The technology that I had then has now been rolled into history pen. Um, but we, we worked on a, uh, this was, the idea here was basically taking photos that are in the public domain and put it into the historical context of today or the locative context today, sort of like Deer Photograph or other examples like this. So I took this uh, Dorothy Lang photo and put it in place in Japantown and you see the power of this photo <laughs> over a location that is otherwise nondescript, this gate, you know, bringing it to life. Mashup culture, right? Or even very simple things like taking an iconic photograph like this. This is a Swedish artist, Santa Dolloway, and colorizing it. Bringing that to life in a new way. Making that relevant in a new way. Or this one, you know, the Bikini Atoll. In black and white, it seems you know, horrifying enough. But what would, what would it really look like in color? You know, bringing that to life. Making it immersive. And having fun with this stuff, too. Here's an uh, example, Burrito Justice. I'm going to show you a lot of examples from San Francisco, where we've got, obviously, a pretty tech-heavy community, um, lots of history buffs, uh, suspenders, mustaches, you know, fancy bars, bartenders, that whole thing. You know, so this Burrito Justice is a guy, John, who uh, worked with a couple friends to map. This is the Mission District, and this is San Francisco Seal Stadium, which is now a shopping mall, kind of a strip mall here. They tore it down, uh, I think, in the 50s, basically. So what these guys did is they took the Sanborn maps, found out exactly where everything was. They wanted to see it come to life again. But of course, now there's a strip mall. But, so what they decided to do was put the bases on the store. So do a little guerrilla uh, history there. You know, <laughs> I don't know if that's the term, guerrilla history. But they went in and went to the stores and actually put the bases on the, on the ground in the stores, which is fun, right? So here's Office Depot has got uh, home plate, I think, or third base. Uh, here's another example. And this is the idea of kind of rediscovering history, too. So this is uh, Mission Mission, which is a blog in, in San Francisco's Mission District. They do all kinds of funny stuff around the city. Um, and there, there was this discovery, rediscovery, if you will, 122-year-old gravestone washes up on Ocean Beach. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see this as we kind of page through here. What, there's a, great, a tombstone on the beach. Like, what the hell? Somebody found this thing. And they looked into it. They looked deeper. 1890, right? So they've just got the, why is this in the middle of the beach? And so you get this. There's like 125 comments on this as they find, all right, here's the person. This is when she died. This is who she was married to. Somebody goes even further, finds the house where she lived in, and a picture of it. My God, how do they do this? And then you see all this kind of, what happened here? How could this thing end up on a beach? Somebody says, well, maybe a, a whale swallowed it during a tsunami and somebody <laughs> regurgitated it. Yeah, that's totally what happened. You know, you just kind of see these comments go through of what happened. Well, it turns out that uh, when they moved all of the cemeteries to Colma, San Francisco, after 1906, they, they moved all the cemeteries. And it turns out that as people dug deeper, they found out what had happened, and they took a lot of these old tombstones, and they used them as curbs and as breakwaters in this case. Right? So there's actually this whole row of uh, tombstones that are under the, under the sands. And as the sands shift, people found that. So the local newspaper historian picked it up and, and ran kind of an article and said, yeah, these things happen all the time. You know, it's old news. But what happened was people rediscovered this history and brought it back to life. And that was what was so exciting about it, because they felt like it was their discovery. And ultimately, it was. You know, who's to say it wasn't? Well, here's another example. Uh, it's called oldsf.org of how people are mashing up history. Right. So this is uh, the San Francisco Public Library has uh, an amazing historical photo collection, and um, 
you know, they've got it available on the web. You can kind of narrow down by, by neighborhood. And they've invested in the infrastructure, you know, probably 10 years ago or so. Well, there was a developer who decided he wanted to see this stuff on a map, very similar to my passion of seeing things on a map. We're all seeing things on maps in locations. So what he ended up doing was he screen scraped the whole site and took down 40,000 photos and images, put it into a database, and he's a geo developer, so he was able to use scripts over a course of two years to, to narrow down about 10,000 photos to their locations. He did this all on his own, and, and when we launched the History Pin, uh, when we launched History Pin in 2011 officially in New York, he came up to me and said, hey, I've got this great project, you know, what do you think? I'm thinking about launching it. I was like, dude, that sounds awesome, but you should probably talk to them first before you do it. <laughs> so he, you know, we, we, I introduced him to the folks at the at San Francisco Public Library, and they were into it. It kind of gave him his blessing. And so they were able to launch this site, which is a great new discovery. Now, this is a developer who was passionate about history, who built this thing on his own, on his own time. And the library was thrilled with it. And, and when we sat down and met after he had launched it, and they got all kinds of great press and reviews about it, we kind of made the point that, you know, he built this thing. He wasn't sure how he could use this stuff. So it was kind of a, a look at the policy issues there. You know, tell people how they can use your information. Uh, and who knows what they might do with it. It might be something as amazing as this. Uh, a few more examples. Here's uh, Past Mapper, this guy Brad, who's gathering information and data about historical places in San Francisco, and he's created, this is one of the apps that he's built, um, which allows you to check into places that are no longer there. So if you want to roll in the 1960s San Francisco, you can actually check into the Golden Pheasant, 1966. You know, that's where I'm hanging out. For, you know, forget about the mustache bartenders, I'm really going there. And then you've got this image from uh, Bullet, you know, Steve McQueen walking around, and that's, he's walking past the golden pheasant at this point. Well, you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of mashups like this, which take the old photos and mesh them into the recent photos. This is another San Francisco uh, enthusiast, a, photog a photographer, and he um, took these photos from 1906 earthquake and put it in its location. You can see the background buildings maybe still there the cars, and this woman getting into her Mercedes around the, the crushed horses. I mean, just the, it brings it to life in a new way. And that's, that's what we're trying to enable with these kinds of things. You know, a couple of examples here of how people are using existing technologies. You're not building new things necessarily. You're using stuff that's already out there. So this is a contemporary Jewish museum uh, in coordination with the photo exhibit that they had. They created SF Photo on, which just used Instagram ultimately and encouraged people to mark, mark up their own uh, experience of the city uh, and, and make that a part of the exhibit. Or the New York Public Library, this is uh, an example of people using Pinterest, institutions using Pinterest. So all these are public domain uh, images from atlases, it looks like. I mean, they've got all kinds of different images here, and they've put it out there. Ways for people to rediscover it and re-engage and reuse it. You know, I know my, I myself at one point took one of the uh, Sanborn maps and created a skateboard out of it, you know, for San Francisco. You know, who knows what people are going to build with it? But they're having fun with it and rediscovering it and ultimately making it their own. Now, this is not isolated to San Francisco. How many people have heard of Ghost of DC, of this, of this blog? Uh, this is a great example of a project. Now, this is a guy. Now, it's interesting to see that these people, you know, <coughs> People are putting these projects together, doing it on their own time. They're using, this guy goes by the name of Officer Sprinkle. They're using pseudonyms because they have day jobs, right? And they don't want them to know how much time they're spending on these kinds of things. But he's created this amazing <laughs> site. And he just digs and digs and digs, finds a photo. He might find it on the National Archives. He might find it on Shortby, wherever he finds it. You know, but, but bringing it to the public in a way that gets them involved in the community. So these are all examples of mashups and the culture that exists that we can tap into. I want to spend a few minutes on the technology and the concept of linked open data and what the opportunities are for that. Um, and, and really look at this for a few minutes. Uh, the idea, ultimately, of the World Wide Web is that we could create a web of documents, that we could put things up there and we could link from one document to the next. That's all it was. It's a very simple idea, and for, it has to be simple for it to scale. So the idea of linked data, linked open data, we'll go into the, the differences there and, and, and 
you know, but the, the difference here is going from a web of documents to a web of data. So we have all this data locked up in databases, metadata about things, names, informations, and up until now, we've typically used tables to link that information from one to another, which gets us pretty far. But in the, in the long run, it doesn't scale on the web, you know, the, 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 the scale of interoperation of the web, right? So what we're moving to more is this idea of graphs, going from tables to graphs. And looking at everything, every point of information has nodes and links. And that's the dream of linked open data, that we can start to make connections. So this is just an example of a, a Twitter network. Uh, this was at a, a, an unconference at that camp um, and how people were connected from Twitter. So we can kind of use that as an analogy to explain some of these things. Now, as the computer, computing power, power increases, the ability to start to put, put these things together in new ways is giving us this opportunity to take these graphs and build upon these you know, massive amounts of information and utilize them in new ways. So what we can visualize as a graph here, you might see as, you know, might link up as a table or appear as a table in this way. Now, the, the very basic concept of linked open data revolves around this idea of triples, that every piece of information on the web can be explained by or described in a subject predicate object relationship. So to keep it quite simply on uh, the Twitter example, uh, John Voss follows US National Archives, for instance, subject predicate object. It's like a simple sentence, right? But this gives us the ability to describe entities in a way that a machine can read it and can understand it and take that to scale so that we can start to see entire networks evolve that way. I like to pick on Ed Summers, who's here today. I mean, he cringes every time this talk gets shown somewhere around the world and everyone blows him up on Twitter, right? Uh, so, Ed, but Ed, you know, let's, let's see what we know about Ed and use, kind of take this Twitter analogy a little bit further, right? So we know, um, you know, that he's got a bio that he's published. He's a hacker for libraries, digital archaeologist, pragmatist. We also know that he knows through his Twitter networks, Dan or Julie, uh, we know that there's depictions of him on the web, photographs, example, right? So these are all triples, right? We can, we can create statements about all that information in triples. We can serialize it using, there's a number of ways we can do it, but resource description framework or RDF is the primary way of doing that, right? So RDF XML, RDF A, there's multiple ways to do this, but it all revolves around that subject predicate object. And if we're presenting our information in this way, we're being consistent about it, then machines can predict how that information is going to be used and accessed. So we're getting close to being able to talk to the machines. You know, a few more hams, beers, and we're almost there. I'm going to throw up a little bit of code here. And this is how we know everything about Ed. Because he's created this, you know, he's put up this document. You can see the document lives here, ehs.rdf. And if you've looked at an XML sheet or you've looked at HTML, it's not that different. You know, it's not that scary. Ultimately, the first line just tells us this is an RDF representation of all that information. And then it goes through and says, everything we're going to say about this subject is, you know, this is all Ed Summers. We're going to say, here's a bio for him. Here's a name for him. And we're going to link to those things as well. So you've got the subject, the predicate, the object. And you've linked those things so that you're starting to grow this web of data so you can go further. So now this is, I mean, we do put a lot of information about ourselves up on the web. Ed has done us the favor of putting it in one place, which is kind of scary how much information we put out there, right? We can see his Twitter ID. We can see his LinkedIn, you know, his Flickr account, his library thing account, GitHub, et cetera. But these things link off to other pieces of information so we can start to grow that graph of data. Right, so we can go to his Twitter account, see who his friends are, access that, access their friends, start to grow this information. And that's the, the idea, the basic idea be behind linked open data. Well, let's, let's put that into the context of uh, cultural heritage data and, and look at one example here. Um, this is civilwardata150.net, which we built as sort of a pilot back in... 2009-2010, and the hope here was to use uh, going into the Civil War sesquicentennial uh, to build links around different content uh, revolving around the Civil American Civil War. So this is just an example and a visualization of what that could look like. Uh, so you see the, the middle circle in the, uh, is a historical marker for the U.S. Um, first 
first colored regiment, it's called, and it became part of the US colored troops. And from that information, you know, building on a database of historical markers, we can link out and find information about that regiment, for instance. So we're building on the very simple vocabulary of regiments, battles, and places with this particular project. So you can see where did they engage in battles? Where did this particular regiment travel to? Who are the commanders? You know, these are all you know, linked to those photographs that exist right on US National Archives of Library of Congress. Where are there other historical markers for the US colored troops? Um, who are the soldiers themselves who were part of this regiment? When did they die? How did they die? When were they mustered? Um, you know, where are, the, where are the maps of the locations they were from? What did the train routes look like? How did they travel, et cetera? What were the regimental flags? All of this information is out there in different databases. And the dream, the hope, is that we can start to use uh, a web protocol to start to bring that information into one place. Well, we can take that a bit further and see. The, so this is an example of conflicthistory.com. This is a site that's out there. And they've mapped uh, all of the data about human battles, wars, anything that's been termed a battle in Wikipedia. So all of that structured data that exists in Wikipedia, we can access through a project called DBpedia and another called Freebase. And so they've mapped here, we've just narrowed this down I mean, there's so many wars, battles through history. We've just narrowed this down to the United States from 1861 to 1865. And here we can basically see the primary battles of the Civil War. Um, and by clicking on one, on one of those, we can dig deeper into, uh, I think, the, the Battle of Iuka, for instance, right, in Mississippi. So we can see information about that battle. And we can see a map of the battlefield, which exists uh, out in the public domain. We can see the, the description of the battle. Uh, all of this information coming from Wikipedia, which has been culled from other sources. And in fact, in this site, you can actually go down and edit that information um, as well. I don't show a link for that, actually. But you can go down into Freebase and edit. Oh, you see a link here that says Edit Facts. So you can go into Freebase, which is uh, a, an open community database where you can actually edit that information or you could edit it in Wikipedia for that matter um, if you think something's incorrect. But this is pulling all this information from different locations. And we can continue to take that idea of, of gathering information from the very simple vocabulary of the Civil War, regiments, uh, battles, in locations, for instance, so we can start to look at books. This is from the Open Library. This is, um, you know, there's, I learned this in the course of working on this project, but there's hundreds and hundreds of regimental histories that are written specifically about one particular regiment. So if we're following the 36th Regiment of Indiana, uh, Indiana Infantry, we can start to dig into that. And we'll, behind the scenes at, at uh, the Open Library project, you can start to see, here's RDF again. So we can start to see how we could build links on this. So now, the RDF that they're using here and the, the markup that they've used is using a lot of DC terms for subject. Um, you can start to see, you know, what is, what is the subject of this book? What does it pertain to? Uh, hopefully, you could start to link out to other things. Now, this is I mean, part of the point here is that this doesn't have a lot of links to it. This is telling us this is all about that one book. But hopefully you'd be able to link to uh, Indiana or link to the Civil War. You can see some of these descriptions of what's covered in the book. And the point of linked open data is that this is something that we're building right now. We're kind of 1991 in the World Wide Web, 1992, 93, maybe a little bit further along, but that we're building this together and that we're trying to come up with the standards for which we do this. And to me, that's part of why libraries, archives, and museums are in such a central role. We have so much structured data and trying to figure out how to use that and how to build for it, those use cases, again, paves the way for you know, this web of data. Well, we can continue to throw more and more information at this graph. Uh, here's a project from University of Richmond where they're looking at the events that led to emancipation uh, around the Civil War. So these are all places in, you know, place, places on a map, locations as well as specific dates, things that happened cold from newspaper articles or other kinds of things. And being able to pull this into that graph of data that we're talking about just around the Civil War and using that for academic research and actually getting, you know, finding new results from the information that we hadn't put together yet. 
Well, in this, I want to talk a little bit about History Pin, which is the project that I work on. That's my day job. Um, a lot of the linked open data stuff and the Civil War st I've done on the side. Uh, but History Pin is a, a project that is really starting to take this to the masses, the idea of cultural heritage institutions sharing their data in a way that we can start to mash that up together in new ways. Um, so we now have over 650 cultural heritage institutions that are contributing content, 40,000 users. Uh, that are putting their information out there, exploring the map on a large scale. How we can take all of these projects that are out there in isolation, the Ghost of DC research, the work that Burrito Justice is doing, Brad at PassMapper, et cetera. How can we share this and use this uh, in the long run? Uh, obviously, we've got uh, National Archives on History Pins, you know. They've put up tons of stuff, a lot of great uh, data, information, street views of this thing. You can see the Imperial War Museum. Uh, another example. So these are all institutions that are putting up their information. They're saying how people can use it. You're able to find it on a map. Um, this is just hundreds of institutions are, are putting things up, you know. And, and we give people the, the ability to actually embed there. So once they've put their content up there, they've put it on a map, they can then embed that in their own site. So we're seeing a lot of institutions use that. This is an example at the London School of Economics. It has a great photo collection, which has been kind of in this list. Uh, environment for a long time. You can see it just at the top here. Um, but now they're able to embed the map there and, and see, see it in Street View and see some of the other things. And I just, another example, this is one of my favorites from the National Archives, also relevant for today, yesterday. Um, this is from the March on Washington in 1963 tour that you guys put together. This is one of my favorites, right? And, and bringing this into Street View, bringing history back to life in new ways. And then taking this into the mobile setting, we have mobile apps uh, that you can start to see, you know, walk around and find this kind of time machine in your pocket um, and being able to explore these different kinds of environments and, you know, find your way, point you to that direction and put it over that. So what are the ramifications for this with linked open data? This is a, a project that we've worked on with King's College in London, and it's uh, a prototype essentially. So now that we've got hundreds of thousands of Im historical images. We know the date it was taken. We know the place where it was. What can we do with that information? So this was an example of uh, kind of a user interface design, which we've tested, and, and working with uh, the archives, I think it was AIM25, which is a number of archives around London's um, main area there. And so this here's a picture of the strand. So we know where we are and, and what date it is. What other uh, collections are relevant to that location. So you can dig deeper. This is the idea. So it's starting to play with this kind of user interface for how you can find out more about that information. So here in this example, we could find out that this, there's a collection relevant to this location, the Strand. And so you can go and find, you know, drill down into that collection to find more. We're seeing other developers do really amazing things with these kinds of projects. Uh, so here's, this is Tim Ray, who's a PhD candidate in Australia. So he's uh, studying museum, museum studies and semantic web, which is kind of the bigger picture of linked open data. You can almost use linked data and semantic web synonymously. But uh, so what he's done here is he's used the Brooklyn Museum's API and the Prezi engine, which you can see that kind of shifting if anyone's used Prezi for, for um, presentations. And, and he's created an algorithm that finds similarities in the metadata itself. So this is all, you know, Brooklyn, in fact, when I gave this presentation at some point, somebody from Brooklyn Museum came to me afterwards and said, I had no idea this was happening. You're like, yeah, somebody built this with your stuff. You know, this is what people are building with that information. Um, and so he's, he's enabled you to kind of simulate the random experience of walking through an exhibit and finding those connections. Because oftentimes when we're using finding aids, you have to know what you're looking for to find it. And he wanted to simulate this idea of randomly coming across a piece of art or something that was inspiring to him. Uh, so here's another example of, it's called a project called Small Demons. And this enables you to find some of the links within books. So here's an example of the life of Pi, um, which gives us uh, the ability now to see what else, where, where else was this book mentioned, for instance, or what appeared in this. So it's finding the known entities within books, enabling us to discover that information. So down at the bottom, you can see Indiri Gandhi and others 
uh, other people that appeared in this book. You can see the kinds of foods that appeared in this book, the kind of places on a map that appeared in this book. Now, so this gives us the ability to look at information and digest information in new ways and find those connections across different collections. So that's some of the technology behind linked data. Now, you can have linked data and you can have open data completely separately from one another. So the, the linked data refers to, and I always capitalize it when I use it because it refers to the web protocol of linked data uh, and the RDF protocol, et cetera. Uh, there's also a legal element to this, and there's a lot of policy work to be done. So, you, you know, without having the techno technological expertise, we certainly have work that we can do on the policy front. And that's making this information available for people to use in different ways. Um, one of the critical parts of this that we found within the libraries, archives, museums community is separating the assets from the metadata and making sure that we're licensing those in different ways, or at least licensing them separately. So you can have one license for this photograph, because it's Library of Congress and the Matthew Brady collection, we know it's public domain, but if this was in a smaller collection, you could say, well, you can only use this a certain way. But the metadata can be used another way. Right? We can say that we, we know without a doubt that we own the metadata on this, and we're going to put this into the public domain, or we're going to put this in using a, a, a Creative Commons license, et cetera. If you just give us the metadata, developers can do a lot with that. We can find out where the image lives, we can find out what the image pertains to, and we can start to build these representations similar to what we've seen at the SFPL site uh, in the old SF project, right? That was just a matter of finding the locations of the photos and finding where the photos lived on the web and creating a, a project out of that. So the, the legal advances, you know, using Creative Commons has given us the ability to use uh, common, uh, to basically use common descriptions for how people can use this content, as opposed to saying, well, here's a long list of how we say you can use it and you have to talk to our lawyer before you do it this way. Just put a license on it, and that tells us how we can use it. So when we say linked open data, the open data part of that, also capitalized, refers to very specific uh, legal licenses, right? So Creative Commons by is uh, by attribution, so it means that you can use this uh, commercially, you can use it in any way, but you have to give attribution to it. CC0 means that I own the copyright to something, but I give it to you, to the public to use for free. So I basically surrender my copyright, that's what CC0 means. Or the public domain mark, which is to say it's been, you know, we can see it's, it's created by a government agency, a, a U.S. federal government agency, we can claim that it has a public domain mark. And, that way I can say anything that I'm using from National Archives, I can put a public domain mark on that, for instance. Um, and then there's also database. These are more popular in Europe because they have different laws uh, regarding database, you know, when you put information into databases. So here's a couple of examples of the public domain dedication and license, the attribution license, uh, ODC by. These guys need a graphic artist, obviously. It's much easier to, uh, to visualize what we've got with Creative Commons. And then I say this one is open-ish, CC by SA. A lot of people consider this open. Some people don't consider it open. Freebase, for instance, doesn't, uh, doesn't acknowledge CC by SA as an open license. Because when you, basically when you start to get all this metadata, we start to say, we look back at that Civil War graph, right? If I've got all these images from the archives in Michigan, and I can use all that metadata in CC by, well, and I build another application that's bringing in others, you start to have to stack up the, the different licenses. So that's why we're really pushing for a CC0 license for things, so that we can have open license to use this in many different ways. But all of these are, are considered open. Now you can also use Creative Commons licenses to publish things in ways that aren't open. These are published data that, you know, these, all these acronyms, you know, by is, is by attribution, NC is non-commercial, ND is no derivative. So you can choose the one that suits your needs the most. A lot of institutions are using CC by NC uh, for non-commercial, so they don't want it to be used for commercial purposes. Technically it's not an open license, but it does tell us how we can use it. So I can create a project that uh, uses it for non-profit purposes or education purposes, but I can't sell ads on it, for instance. So the main thing is that we're telling people this is what we have, and this is how you can use it. And that's, that's the legal element here. That's what we've got. So it may sound a little complicated, and it may sound like a dream, maybe, 
but it's not, ultimately. I mean, this is what happens when you go to, to Google right now and you search for U2. You know, you've, you've always used to seeing these things. You might not even notice the kind of information that's coming at you. Um, but you've got the links down the middle. This is what you see. But now with the Google Knowledge Graph, they're using linked data to pull in further information as well. So you can see on the right side, you've got uh, the picture that comes up from Wikipedia. We've got a description of the band. You've got band members, which you can then link through. Right? This is linked data in action. You've got the songs. You can go and listen to those. It's using music brains to pull in that data. You have any upcoming events that are out there. So they've also used schema.org. Um, which is a collaboration of Microsoft, you know, Bing, Yahoo, Google, to create uh, easy ways for people to mark up their data that utilizes linked data and finds that information through the web and can create representations of that on here. So it's really happening. Now, for me, I think the Google part of it is very exciting. It has to be go going to that scale, but ultimately it's about preserving these stories. Sharing the stories and sharing the data in ways that we can continue to connect to people. You know, bringing it to life so it's not just about selling better ads, but it's helping us understand each other. Well, it's a good idea, and if you're into it, you know, I have to say you're not alone. You know, it's not just a bunch of us who are in our basements building these things. The more and more we talk to each other, the more we can build this community of the new web of data. You know, it's happening. It really is. In 2010, when I first started getting people together around linked open data, some of the essential building blocks were already there. I mean, people much smarter than me were putting this stuff together. Um, you could already see that the British Library, Stanford University, uh, CERN, Open Library, these uh, University of Michigan, all of them had their data published as uh, Creative Commons Zero. Right? So we could start to build off of that. This was in 2010. And the predicates, the building blocks, the uh, VF, uh, ide.loc.gov, the category subject headings, uh, Ed was putting this out there. This stuff was already out there for us to start to build these links and build this graph a little bit bigger and bigger. Uh, the W3C Link Library Data Committee had already come together. You know? So at that time, the, you remember when we could map the internet, right? Or we could map the World Wide Web. That was a fun you know, that was, it seems like forever ago. Now it would be impossible. Well, now, you know, we can still map this ma the linked data graph. It still is possible. Uh, it's not going to be for very long. As you can see, it's almost irrelevant at this point because these bubbles get smaller and smaller. Well, in 2010, the linked data cloud, as, as we saw it there, grew as 300%. But the information pertinent to libraries or that was relevant for libraries grew by nearly 1,000%. And that's going to show that the, the structured data that exists in libraries, archives, and museums is going to really help pave the way for this. Um, at that time in 2011, you know, we, were, we were trying to get the Civil War Data Project funded, and, and we ended up going to the NEH. So in fact, she said, you know what, we really don't know what this linked open data thing is. Why don't you get people together first? So that's why we created the Lodlam Summit uh, in 2011, and we got people together we hoped for maybe 50 people that would be interested in this, and we ended up with uh, over 100, actually. Uh, so the Sloan Foundation, NEH, Internet Archive helped put this together, and we didn't even have enough people to fit around one table here, you know, one restaurant. We had to expand. Uh, and the exciting element is that it started to pick up around the world, and that in 2011, we started to have meetups happening in Atlanta, D.C., London, Wellington, I mean, all around the world, ultimately. Uh, there's a, a great Twitter stream there, Loadlam is the hashtag that you can search on. So people are starting to release their information saying, hey, we've got a data set. Let's put it out there. Or there's an article that's relevant. There's real community building around this. But then since 2011, we've seen the pace p quicken even further. You know? So we started in 2010 with these institutions, and more and more came on. Stanford. Uh, University of Montreal, so we're seeing a lot of science data, Harvard University, University of Florida. All these are CC0 license data sets, and a lot of them are using linked data, making it available as RDF, the National Library of Spain. You know, so there's the German National Library. Europeana, which is huge. You know, the fact that Europeana came on now with 20 million cultural heritage objects, all of that data is available in RDF as linked data, CC0. I mean, this, the precedent has been set. You know, the question for me is, who's got next? And we're seeing more and more people jump into this. 
So how can you get involved with the World Land Movement? I mean, that's why ultimately I'm here at uh, National Archives today to talk about this and, and to get into some of the details of how we can start to join this effort. Um, personally, individually, you can check out lowland.net where you'll see a lot of resources. You can read further about a lot of this information. Um, you can ask for help on the Google group. There's a Google group that you'll see on Lowland, or just throw something out there on Twitter. Uh, and there's also open, you know, this real open data movement, GLAM. We, I call it libraries, archives, and museums here in Europe. It's often termed GLAM, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums. So there's a whole movement internationally of people connecting on this. And Wikipedia, uh, the Wikimedia group is, is doing quite a bit of work on here as well. And mainly contribute, you know, start small with some small domain or some element that you, some project. How would you use this? How can we envision what this web of data is going to look like? And what are the use cases? Um, and finally, we'll be meeting in Montreal in, in the summer. I, I, I didn't really think this was going to be an annual thing by any means, but people really called for it and said, we want to, we want to keep this moving along. And so we've got the, the summit happening in Montreal. We've still got a few spots left. If this is something you're interested in, come and join us. Um, we've got a host of sponsors who've made it possible. Um, and use the tools that are out there. Here's another example of, of Google Refine. Now, these very happy Belgians are here to help you uh, use tools like Google Refine, which is basically like Excel on crack. It enables you to take you know, scores and scores of metadata and start to link it up to the linked data cloud and see what you can, you know, what, what uh, commonalities do you have. I have this wonderful database sitting on my computer, but how can I easily publish it on the web as linked data? The Free Your Metadata team is coming to the rescue! Oh my god! The Free Your Metadata team! First, clean your metadata. Second, link them to all the collections. Thirdly, publish them in a sustainable manner. Uh, well, you know... Library, librarians and instruments sometimes can make a really magical experience. And, and it, uh, so this is part of the Low Dam Challenge. This year, as part of the summit, we've, uh, we're going to have five finalists who have put in entries to compete for uh, sort of an American Idol experience, so, you know, select the best use cases. And these guys were chosen as one of the three in the first round. Uh, and, and they've done a lot of great work to ena enable people to take their collections and link them up. Using, uh, you know, using Google Refine as a tool, which is free and easy to use. Well, not easy, but free. And they walk you through it. So I want to close with one final mashup. Uh, this is from NASA. It takes millions of photos every day from the International Space Station. And people take that and create, you know, add music to it and add things to it. Uh, to make it something that's an experience that we can get into. And I, you know, I have to say, people have dreamed of walking in the stars for tens of thousands of years. But it happened in our lifetime. And it took a lot of money, it took the commitment of nations, tens of thousands of people. Ultimately, it took international collaboration. But we made it happen. And I wonder if time travel is any different. It sounds crazy, but at least some approximation. To use technology to better understand each other, to better understand the past, immerse ourselves in that experience, the questions that people ask before us, and power imaginations. That's ultimately what our role is in this. It's like James Cameron putting us on the deck of a sinking Titanic. Having that imaginative experience, but not using it for profit, not using it for Hollywood or Google, private gain, but how we can use it to answer the questions of our universe here. Understanding each other, our past, our future, and finding what we have in common before figuring out what we have apart from each other. The first steps of global collaboration are already happening. Europeana, Digital Public Library of America, the Lodeland community, these things are happening. And I feel like the National Archives has the opportunity to lead the nation in this. You're already doing it. 
And on behalf of the history freaks and geeks, the nerds who are using pseudonyms out there, we're here to contribute to that as well. And we're excited to work together with you. So thanks for having me here. And I look forward to the rest of the day. Thank you, John. I wonder if you would take questions. If sure. There's questions from anybody in the audience? John, what do you think um, an institution like ours needs to do to kind of encourage developers to work with our material? Is it linked to open data? Or are there steps maybe before linked to open data? Yeah, there are definitely steps before. I mean, linked open data is going for for the big prize, you know, really really making it available on a larger scale. But keeping that in mind is important as well. You know, looking at that goal of what's going to be happening two, three, four years down the line. I think the open data part is pretty massive as well, right? So the great thing about National Archives is so much of it's in the public domain. There's so much that we can do to build off of that. Um, already you've got an amazing team that's putting information out there in ways that makes it accessible using things like history pin and Flickr commons, etc. Um, but I think very simply it's telling people what you have and how they can use it and getting it out there in ways. I think one example is as part of the um, Civil War project what we ended up doing was um, we screen scraped some content from the, from the Matthew Brady photo collection. And so they've really done a great job of making it available to view, kind of browse through the photos, for instance. Um, but when we were able to pull down all that metadata and look at it in Excel sheet, we started to see patterns jump out that we hadn't seen before. And so making it easy for people to access data in that way, you know, making it available as a CSV file, for instance, on particular collections. So find small domains that you can start putting information on. I think that would be a great way to do it, you know, if it's around Civil War, it's around a specific event, World War One, or coming up to that sesquicent or that centenary um, in 2015, you know, finding those pieces of content and putting it out there in ways so that people can get to that raw data and build from that. I mean, I think that's one of the first steps. Do you think uh, cultural heritage data will play a big role in the growth of the semantic web, kind of like a stepping stone? Uh, I've go, mentioned, you know, it goes back to 2004, 2006, but really, it hasn't gone mainstream yet. Uh, yeah, I, my hope is that it will. I think it really is that there is that possibility. I mean, ultimately, you've got structured data and you've got hundreds of years of experience in how to deal with that structured data that's ready to come out and be used in a way that's really useful. Uh, it, it occurred to me, I went to the Semantic Web conference, uh, I think it was in June or so, and I was there, and, and there were a couple other library folks uh, who I was sitting next to, and there was a, a panel on schema.org, in, in which schema.org is this Yahoo um, being uh, Google collaborative, right, to, to use markup to, to find the vocabulary of the web, find events, etc. And it's this great movement, you know, it's this great community of people building this. And what I realized was that these developers were talking about schema and ontologies. And when I turned to the librarian who I was with, I was like, isn't this what you guys do? I mean, come on, we're leaving this to developers. They, they're, they're making this great progress. And I think that there's this real opportunity for people within cultural heritage to contribute to that community at this point and really add to that in a way that, you know, this is, it's not going to be as exhaustive maybe as, as a, a mark sheet or, or EAD records, but it's going to get it down to the bare minimum that people can use it. And I think that's where the opportunity lays. You know, you've got tons of structured data. You've got very, you know, hundreds of years of experience in how to utilize that structured data and then what people can do with that. So I think, I, I do think it is a building block for sure. And uh, you had that example, uh, was it Tim Ray? Or, yeah. Uh, who, you know, you were, I guess you were visiting a conference somewhere where uh, he was presenting the, so, the work that he had done. I, I met Tim, yeah, I met him in New Zealand, actually. Oh, he was at the National Digital Forum in New Zealand, and he had presented on that, that work there. That's how I met him. And then you were able to connect that project that he presented on there with the, was it Brooklyn Museum or? He did it himself. No, he, he had presented on that. He actually used, well, he used the Brooklyn Museum API yeah. to build that. And he also did a virtual museum of the Pacific, which he used to link two separate collections on 
Pacific Islands, basically, and yeah. did another example. But you let the Brooklyn Museum know they they didn't know that he was doing what he was doing, right? Yeah, I think yeah, I think Shelley Bernstein there probably knew who was on the developer side. But when I oh. gave the presentation, I think it was at the SAA conference. Somebody from Brooklyn Museum who was kind of in policy or, or something for yeah. the chain I was like, ah, I had no idea people were doing this. So yeah. I guess this is a roundabout way of asking a question. Like, uh, did do you um, uh, like it, are are there patterns or or, or, or ways that sort of um, good for connecting basically? The, so you have this luxury of being able to go around and yeah. and, uh, and and present at these different workshops and whatnot, and, and putting the workshops on and having people come. Um, is that is that like the best way I think to, to get people to for for publishers of data sets to understand how they're getting used because we sometimes have at the yeah. of commerce we've had this this challenge we're putting data out there but it's often hard to connect the dots between us putting the data out there and then the data getting used in various different ways. So I'm I was wondering if you had any ideas mm -hmm. about the best ways to sort of connect those dots. Yeah, the best way is definitely not me having to go around and yeah. connect the dots, <laughs> but yeah but I agree that well, it's yeah, it's maybe something. I mean, I think if if anything, if I played a role, <coughs> excuse me, of of catalyst, then then great. Then there's there's a time for that. Um, but part of what we tried to do with creating the Loadlam community is just say, hey, there's a there's a world of people who are trying to do this right now, and find the ways for people to connect through that. Um, I think that the attribution, you know, a lot of a lot of CC licenses do require that attribution. And there's not necessarily a good way to say, hey, we're using it this way. Also, there are a lot of institutions that have put things out there in APIs, as Library of Congress has done, for instance, and you just don't know how people are using those. They might come some other way. F for me, the LoadLAM Summit in 2013 and, and highlighting these use cases is one way to say, look, this is how people are using these things. But I don't, you know, I'm not sure, aside from really facilitating community and conversation, um, that there's a way to do that. And ultimately, you know, it will just be this kind of environment of, of data that's being used in different ways. And you might say, like the U2, that U2 slide on the Google search, right? it's just showing up somewhere. Your data might just be showing up, and you, and you won't see that. Um, but it will be improving the, the environments of, or the, you know, the interpretation of data that's being used. Um, the societies that you listed were all open societies uh, in general. Uh, is there anything in China, Russia, mm. uh, places like that where there's similar movements going on? Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't seen much in China or Russia. We've seen a lot in Korea and uh, uh, Singapore, Taiwan. We're seeing delegates at the Lowland Summit from, from those countries. But yeah, I mean, I th it's... I think where you have countries and regimes that are trying to limit the internet, they're certainly not, or trying to limit access to the World Wide Web, they're not going to really be behind this idea of linked open data. Um, it's, it would run uh, against kind of their control over information. So no, I'm not seeing a lot of that. Your um, prototype with the, the London Street plan, yeah. that it was linked to what looked to be like textual yeah. Was that just collection level records or exactly? Um, yeah. Individual document level. It was collection level. So that was one of the things that we were looking at as part of that project. So that was um, it was called Step Change was the name of that project out of King's College. And what they were able to do was use linked data from one of the content management. I'm not sure about those numbers exactly, but that's to my recollection. And so what they were able to do is use Calm uh, to use linked data to get the collection level information at least. Now, we weren't able to drill down into the item level. That was the hope eventually, but the metadata wasn't refined enough from the archival information that we could do that. But what we could do was say this collection is relevant to, they were using some kind of markup, TI or something, to identify place names within the archival collection metadata. So to say this collection was relevant to this part of China, this part of the UK, and it lives at this location. So what we were doing was mapping those relevancies okay. so that you could say if you're searching in China, you might not find 
images there, but you might see that this collection is relevant to that. And that was, kind of, that was what the experiment revolved around. So how could we start to help people find those things? And then your Civil <coughs> War project, was that more item level? That was item level, yeah, yeah. And that was pretty much MARC-based data, or? It was, we, we were using MARC and EAD. There was a number of different examples. The, where that project basically got to was we were um, building a vocabulary of the regiments and the battles, so that's sort of what we started with. And I had take, you know, I thought that would be, that part would be easy, but we turned out dealing with a lot of different policy issues of, of what we would use and who could use it. Um, National Park Service has the best index of battles, 283 primary battles. And while the policy essentially is public domain for that information, um, trying to get that freed up to use was, was pretty difficult. As, and they were, you know, they were very helpful and, and they were a participant in that. Um, but that took us a little while. So yeah, then it was a matter of mapping the difference. So if you had National Archives is using one standard, uh, Archives of Michigan is using another. It was, the trick was mapping across those different, you know, building a crosswalk for those different metadata sets. And who, it was primarily, oh, who was the main contributor or was it pretty equal? Of the, of the that, uh, content? Because I know like you had an LC Prince Photographs mark record of right. Well, we started, I mean, we've, this was a pilot project, basically. So we got about maybe eight or 10 different institutions involved with it. So we didn't get very deep. We used the Matthew Brady collection at Library of Congress. I don't think we got it from National Archives, because you also have a Matthew Brady collection here, too. Um, so that was, that was one of the starting points. And then we used um, the regimental histories of, at Open Library. And I'm not sure, are Brady negatives individually available? I know. Yeah, I don't know. Does anyone know? I don't know. They were they were available at Library of Congress, so that's yeah, so that was the start. I hear an arc and they're on Flickr. Yeah. One of the things that I learned actually working on that project with the Matthew Brady negatives is um, I was meeting with Helena Zinkum at Library of Congress and trying to explain this idea of linked open data to her, which didn't really you know wasn't on her radar necessarily. It didn't matter to her either. She runs the prints and photographs. Um, division there, but she was very, you know, very happy to show me the content. And as I was explaining the different pieces of metadata that we had, one of them was a number that I didn't, it didn't make any sense to me. And she was like, oh, these are the numbers that are on the negatives. And she explained that there were two negatives for each photograph, right? And then they were separated at some point when he went bankrupt or something. And in the end, one ended up at NARA and one ended up at the Library of Congress. And this, so we had this piece of identifying information that we could actually pull those things back together using that, ident that number if we had the linked data built out in a way or that we could map, you know, map the metadata in such a way. So it was, really, it was a cool moment for me because it registered for like, oh, yeah, we could do some cool stuff with this. You know, so that was exciting to see. You know, and these are uses that we wouldn't have predicted. Do you have a, sorry, because I have a lot of questions. Uh, do you have a, more of a vision for an item level world versus collection level? Or? Well, I mean, I think if, if you look at history pin, I would love to see, you know, you could you get to the point where you do have item level metadata and you could say this is what we've got and this is how you can use it. For us, we're starting to develop tools now for using crowdsourcing to start to collect more metadata. So for, for the purpose of a history pin, we want to see it on a map, for instance. So let's take the 40,000 photos at the San Francisco Public Library, which we do have item level metadata, but we don't have necessarily location metadata. And let's put that out to the crowd, put it out, you know, map these photos. And that's some of the research that we're doing on the user interface on that. Um, so ultimately, you're starting to get more and more refined metadata on the item level. Uh, so much of the stuff, I think, in archives particularly, we don't have item level <laughs> metadata on. It's just in collections, and if it's been digitized at all. When you say start small, like, do you think about maybe, you know, uh, I mean, I think about narrative, like we have things like art, which describe whole series, or, you know, would it behoove us to pick maybe a more itemized collection? I mean, the example I've talked about before is like the Pentagon Papers or something. Okay. Right? Yeah. You know, if that was data, you could learn about the war, right? Yeah. Right now, it's just yeah. paper that, but, I mean, it's also a, Huge project, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> turn, a huge wall. To turn those papers into data versus what describing the document and linking to a PDF or something. Right. right. 
do you want to talk to? Yeah, that? to that point. One of the projects that we've had really great luck with in terms of getting that metadata out is the Documerica photos. Um, we started by just putting a gazillion of them on Flickr in 2010. Um, and, and Jerry Simmons has been very active in that project as well. Um, but then it's been also a great project to put on history pin because a lot of these ones are, um, they'll have the address or they'll be, the images will be something that's at like a, a community center in a place and since they're from the 70s, um, a lot of these places are still there. So we're able to pull out that metadata either by, because it's in the description, or we can look at it and then compare it to a Google map and then see the data there rather than having to sort of guesswork on some of them. Um, and so that's been a project that's been really successful for us in terms of a small, I mean, it's, it's a giant collection, but in terms of a project that's like one little one to focus on essentially out of all of NARS. So you're stuff. individually cataloging images into Flickr, yes. essentially. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But and then are, since those are described at the item level, the documentary photos, we can, those are like, low hanging fruit in terms of putting them into the process. So there is something to be said for success on the item level versus the collection level. Kind yeah, of, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And those are described in ARC at the item level. So, there, so okay. Okay. the online catalog does go to the item level. And we have, what, 100,000 or so digital objects come from Digital objects in the catalog now that are they're brought down to that item level. And that's what we're building. So right now at the series level, we have about 80% of all of our holdings described. Um, in the catalog, and really what this is is talking about that drill down and how we can use that. Oh, okay, um, so narrow would see it at the item level. See, I mean, the stuff in that this really room resonates room. with me is at the item level, and yeah. you know that that's a lot of stuff that's coming in into the catalog now. And what I what is cool about thinking of things as uh, you know no longer documents, but the data is by putting it in a centralized, standardized repository, we could do huge things. Uh, so these are giant projects, but if we standardize it and have it, you know, centralized in a way, you can take those and flip them into giant projects uh, that I think we can leverage the, the wealth that we have in that catalog into projects like this, as opposed to all of us doing one-offs. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, the, the win to me with that King's College project was that we were able to map the collections of this you know, group of archives, which had never been done before. So you can start to find things in a new way. But on the item level is where you start to build, you can certainly see apps and uses that we can't think of right now what those might be even. It might be somebody who's got a fascination with trains is gonna build something on a collection, you know, that you've put out that way. You, know, you just, we, we don't know what that's gonna look like four or five years down the road. Um, but on the other, I think if we start to think this through, and this is where the international collaboration comes in, right, particularly right now with the DPLA and Europeana, et cetera, if you've put all this information onto Flickr or you've put it onto History Pin, the question is now how do we build that, you know, kind of create a conduit so that if, at History Pin we're publishing it as RDF, so that now you can just point to the unique identifier at History Pin and you can get more information that's been added to a photo that's at you know, at NARA, for instance. Mm -hmm. right, so you might not have the exact latitude and longitude, or you may you started with an address. Once it goes into history pin, now you have a latitude and longitude, and you have a pitch and a yaw, which way was the camera facing, was it looking up and down, et cetera. You may not want to store all that information at NARA or bring that back into your collection metadata, but you could just point to that unique identifier history pin and get that information out of it. That's where you start to see that graph growing, and that's where we're really talking amongst you know, all kinds of international collaborators of what that might look like and how we build that architecture. And that's a really great example of what we do not have the resources to do internally. Yeah. And why it's imperative that we do collaborative projects um, because we'll get the bang for the buck of having worked for, what, over 10 years now on this catalog. How can we then leverage it and, and get some good things out of it? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, we were talking earlier at the, at the beginning here of, um, you know, whether or not libraries, archives, and museums ultimately become those app designers or app inventors, is that the place? Or rather, this is the content that we have, you build something cool with it. You know, attribute it to us if you can, link back to the original sources. But, you know, maybe we're not the, at the library, archive, museum level, not the place where you're inventing the latest, greatest app for history, you know, or film or whatever it might be, the same way, you know? Are you, are you creating the films all the time, et cetera? So. Or maybe it's a combo. 
especially in these economic times, the prioritization of what we can do, and then you know accept what we can't do and work with others who can do that. So. Yeah. Well, and that first step is is that, you know that first question: How do we put this stuff out there in a way that people can use it and start to build from it? And that's that's a small, hopefully a small step. I mean, nothing's a small step here, probably, but <laughs> you know, it's a step. Just an example of what Pam was saying about um, that, that collaborative partnership thing. So we started out working with history and in general, and now you guys are doing all these sort of like you are partnering with other projects as well. So I just finished working on the, the PBS Emancipation Abolitionist Map of America. Right. So even though some of these photos were already on history in general, um, we've now put these photos, I think I have like, I don't know, say 25 um, emancipation and abolition related photos there. And then that's being advertised by PBS, which in, in their um, American experience, yeah. um, film series and their website. And so that's that's visuals that we didn't have before. And History Pin's awesome that you're putting it there, but now PBS is also showing it. And that's way broader than we would have had to begin with. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I mean, this is it's the idea of discovery, ultimately, right? People are finding this and using it in different ways. Yeah. And the abolitionist program was, I mean, that was an amazing project in which we collaborated with them. And, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more this afternoon. Um, but, ex you know, looking at how in a film, normally, you're able to see these photos as part of the narrative. But what they've done with the abolitionist map of America is give the cultural heritage institutions the ability to put those, those photos up and you, for you to discover it in a new way. And they actually go down into the collections a little deeper. So you might never have thought to look at Missouri History Museum. So instead of, for me, like the history nerd who watches till the very end credits, it's like, oh, National <laughs> You're just trying to find like where those photos are from. You could just go to the map and see what's relevant to you. And that, to me, that was what was revolutionary about that project is, is really giving content providers um, a way to be a part of that narrative and, and conversation in a new way. I think also what was really neat from um, a not as techie point of view, because that's the thing that um, I'm still trying to learn, um, is the mashup aspect of it. So you might look, zoom in on Baltimore, and you get a snippet from the film where you see people acting out very well a scene um, from like Frederick Douglass's life. And then you can click on a document that we have about it, and you see the historical document, um, which Maybe my husband would be interested in, but maybe not, unless he looked at this video part first and someone yeah. was talking about the kind of thing, and then he was like, oh, I see how that is in in real life, you know? And then you can click over and be like, oh yeah, this is the document they were talking about. You see them both, the sort of fiction version in terms of acting and then the real thing that's based on. Yeah. And having both pieces, I think, really adds interest. Absolutely. I mean, that's where you talk about the imagination. That's why James Cameron makes the big bucks on Titanic, right? You know, like I've, if it weren't for me being able to imagine having sex with Kate Winslet, maybe I wouldn't be able to like have that experience of knowing the historical detail on the DVD extras of seeing all these little, you know, minutia that they built into there. You know, it really gave you that experience. And it's finding that entertainment versus education value. But that's, I mean, that's the time travel that I'm talking about, is that you're able to imagine what people thought at that time and finding your ways into that uh, and how that data could fuel that dream ultimately. I mean, that's what we're trying to do, is build better time travel, which is silly, maybe, but a dream worth having, I think. So anyway. Well, thank you all for having me. I think we've gone over our time. And thanks, Pam and David. Sarah, thanks for your tireless work and in, in the logistics of, of getting me here. That was great. Thanks, all.